This uh, uh, paper is part of a larger research project that I've been engaged in uh, since last, since 2005. And it was funded by MacArthur Foundation. It was about a uh, $6 million grant. Uh, there were like multiple PIs, all of them are listed here, especially uh, I want to acknowledge uh, Pete Rosius. He's a uh, uh, professor of anthropology and uh, director for Director of Center for in uh, Integrative Conservation in the University of Georgia at Athens. And Thomas McShane, he's in Geneva with IUCN, that's International Union for Conservation of Nature. And Sheila O'Connor, she's um, uh, WWF. And um, it's been really uh, a very collaborative work, very interdisciplinary team. We have um, ecologists and biologists and sociologists and economists on the team. So uh, working with such a large inter interdisciplinary team in itself was quite an experience. And the focus of this uh, overall project was to uh, look at, um, originally when the sustainable development came in the 80s, uh, the, the concept was that we can have some kind of win-win solutions, with, like where we can have economic development and at the same time, uh, environmental conservation. Uh, but disenchantment with that, win-win uh, solutions started to grow with so-called people's versus park controversies in the 90s. And this project grew out of that disenchantment, uh, where we saw that those so-called solutions of ecotourism and biofuels and some of these other solutions that, that, that were labeled as win-win solutions uh, were not showing off the results, at, at least in the context of biodiversity conservation side of it. I mean, they were probably moving forward with the economic development side of it, but the conservation uh, was, uh, we, we still have, if you look at the data, like Tim, Stuart Tim et al. or some of these other studies, uh, biodiversity is being uh, lost at a very rapid rate. And uh, for this project, we chose uh, basically three case study countries, which are the, probably among the largest biodiversity hotspots on this planet. That's uh, uh, Vietnam and Tanzania and Peru. And our focus was all three of them have tropical countries, uh, tropical rainforests, and uh, the focus was on uh, understanding some of those uh, dynamics, especially like with respect to uh, mining and hydropower projects and uh, some of these other um, the timber mafia and logging related projects that were having an impact on these um, uh, the, the tropical rainforest. So this paper is part of the, just focus on the Tanzania side of it, and there are some other papers that I'll talk about as well. And um, I especially uh, focus on um, the, the valuation side of it. And uh, that's why, that was my specific role in this team, uh, was to uh, look at the ecological value, valuation, like how does these pluralistic values uh, that are associated with the anthropogenic environmental change are negotiated. And if you can see that, uh, the, the classical uh, or neoclassical economics um, theory has typically tra uh, looked at trade-offs as like an opportunity cost. So that's how they estimate the, va the, the, the valuation trade-offs, is just by looking, estimating the trade-off uh, by the opportunity cost, and then say, well, the, if uh, we pursue one alternative and whatever is uh, foregone, uh, that's treated as the opportunity cost, and that's the trade-off. But uh, I was uh, coming from a much larger, broader perspective, and not just the opportunity cost being the key perspective. And that's why we, that's where the phrase pluralistic values comes in. And uh, also the focus is on the spatial scale side of it, that understanding these cross-scale trade-offs that ensue from the management options at uh, multiple levels of social organization. And there's been a lot of literature, uh, especially Perthes and all of them, they have uh, looked at the politics of scale side of it. And politics of scale, the way we define, define it in this paper and in our larger project, is uh, that what is traded off and powerful actors at larger scales of social organization uh, influence the policies and management of social socio-ecological systems at relatively smaller scales. So in the previous literature in political ecology and political economy, uh, politics of scale has been, uh, for example, studied in the context of like how globalization forces at the larger scale 
are having an impact on uh, the loss of biodiversity at the local scale. Uh, so they have looked at it from the development side of it. And, um, and for example, like Josh's papers in ecological economics have talked about how international trade is uh, leading to a call, uh, kind of loss of about $3 billion worth of ecosystem services. So uh, maybe I, I'm wrong with the number, but... Well, I was something. actually saying that we pay like 3 to $4 trillion to convert ecosystem structure into goods and services and virtually nothing to preserve ecosystem services. Right, so there's, yeah. there's kind of like an imbalance so that the that trade leads to a loss of, so that we, the global community drives the benefits via the trade of those uh, products from uh, the tropical rainforest or some other rainforest, but the local communities in return do not get as much benefit. And in this particular case, we are looking at the converse side of it, is that when global scale organizations like WWF and IUCN enforce conservation on the local communities, that also leads to a kind of a politics of scale where the local communities are not able to um, derive their economic development or other livelihood benefits that are that they want uh, to have them, and they were basically part of these habitats from there from where these people have been driven out. So well, I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more when we uh, I introduce the empirical <coughs> case study. Um, but in the previous literature, typically these politics of scale has been attributed to these different uh, factors like the dependence of local areas on other places. So typically local areas have been portrayed as dependent on the national or the international level organizations for a variety of resource uh, uh, flows. Um, one uh, important point that I want to make um, is that in our uh, research, uh, the, the focus is explicitly on the management side of it. Is that how can we manage these uh, biodiversity hotspots or conservation parks? So um, that was not explicitly the focus in the previous politics of scale uh, literature. And uh, as I mentioned, so our key hypothesis is that uh, that the conservation-oriented or development-oriented extreme management scenarios generate higher value for international and national scale social organizations while mixed or balanced management scenarios generate higher value for local scale social organizations. But we, we, we do retain, even when we have mixed or balanced management scenarios, we still have trade-offs. So the trade-offs are always there. It's just a question of like how does that value shift across the spatial scales. And this also applies to the temporal scales, but in this particular paper, we have not addressed the temporal scale. So, the, the case study is focused on, this is, uh, the Tanzania is probably, uh, uh, has attracted a lot of attention in the last few years because it, they fortunately still have a lot of uh, tropical forests that are out there. And if you can see that in the middle is Ruaha National Park, and that's where our case study has been focused, but we've also done some work in Sardani and uh, Kilimanjaro. And, uh, Especially this study was focused on, uh, when we started the project in 2005, in 2006, Tanzanian government, uh, there was an Usungu game reserve just on the southeastern side of this Ruaha National Park. They, there were about seven villages uh, which were evicted uh, because the, the Tanzanian national government decided to expand the park boundaries for a variety of reasons. And that eviction uh, was um, one of the key causes that we focused our attention on this specific area uh, within this country. And what we found was that um, when we spoke with the national government people that why had they decided to expand this, they said that uh, the, th there were some uh, water issues there in the World Bank had built a hydropower dam on the north side so there is a greater Ruaha River that flows on the eastern side of this uh, national park. And that river had started to run dry during their short and long dry season. And uh, because the, world, the, the dam that was built upstream uh, was being used for irrigation on the northeastern side of the park. So they wanted to uh, 
save those wetlands from destruction and expansion by these nearby uh, urban area. And secondly, they, they were also concerns that these people were, uh, the, the, the local, local people were uh, in, engaged in poaching and some of these other activities. So uh, even though those people claimed that they, would never, they never did that, they were part of that <coughs> ring. So the conflict was uh, very intense when, when we went in there. The, um, the, according to the local people, when we introduced them, they said the international regulations uh, governing this forced relocation or eviction were not observed. Some of them, for example, claimed, said that they were denied any permanent employment op opportunities at the park. Uh, another one, they said that uh, they have been completely unlucky living <coughs> close to them, and they also, which I didn't cite the, uh, here, they said that they are, all the payments that were made to them, they were not fair. Uh, and when we asked the government people, they said that actually they were paid a fair compensation. So there were a lot of tension about what is fair compensation, what is not fair compensation. Uh, the local people also said that they are, uh, especially the, the, the challenge was that they were uh, spiritually uh, attached to those habitat from where they were evicted. They said they are, uh, the spirits of their forefathers had lived on the trees uh, of, from where they were evicted, and they were sent to a new place, which was about 100 to 150 kilometers uh, south of that place. So they said that they had to travel uh, every week to visit the spirits of their grandfathers. So how can you put a dollar value or whatever value, monetary value, on uh, that spiritual side of it? <laughs> this came up, you know, when the dam applications in China also were, you know, they could give them all, they, they could have given them adequate financial compensation, but they lost their entire community, lost their entire culture, they lost their ability to farm because they were sent to another place where it wasn't the same kind of soil or, or the same kind of territory. They uh, were outcasts from the community where they went. <clears throat> so there were all these non-financial issues you know, that, that didn't get taken into account. It sounds right. like the same situation. It, it was very similar. And then they were promised that in the new place there would be schools and some other place, so the, um, other social uh, infrastructure that would be built for them and that was never built. Uh, that At least our sociologists on the team confirmed that. But the government people said that the plans were there and it would be done. But as, uh, as of last year, uh, it was not done there. I think you mentioned the number of villages. How many people are we talking about? So we are talking about like in a given village anywhere from 300 to 400 people. So sometimes like 500. These are like they live in like large families. Right. Typically, it's a, a multi-generational family structure. Uh, like uh, we've seen some families with like four generations living together. They mentioned tribalism. Was that actually true? I mean, is there a tribal majority in Tanzania? And this this is a minority group in this area? Well, this is ironical. We basically, they are accusing government of having the tribal mentality. So this, that's why we picked this up. Because they said that government, this is the statement that one of the local respondents said. So uh, the methodology that we I used was, uh, this was developed by our team, and it's a, uh, just a modified version of standard multi-criteria to see an analysis but we add more deliberative and more softer versions. So, um, and this was influenced by John uh, Martinez Elliott. He was also one of the influential uh, um, people in the board of our project uh, in 2006, 2007, and he said that we need to uh, develop more softer approaches that, so he's uh, 1998 paper in ecological economics uh, that argues for that. So basically, so we're not, Especially, so the, uh, so there is the harder version of MCDA and softer version. So what we are doing here is more like a softer version of that. So there are like uh, uh, the impact functions, the weight functions are more, much more softly calculated and more, much more deliberatively calculated as opposed to uh, having them calculate uh, based on like very hardcore, um, like standard MCDA approaches that are done. And uh, so we do them pre, uh, like in visual assign the weights and then also uh, uh, we bring them together in groups and then also workshop level. And uh, another thing that we do is, so VI is the, the, the expected value of the ith alternative in a set of like say, if we have like uh, uh, n alternatives that we are comparing on uh, m criteria and WJK represents the weights that are assigned to m criteria and uh, that's constrained, so it's the constant some weight 
and the psi mm -hmm. sign, so there are k stakeholders in the uh, system, and uh, if, so we, we, uh, we, we have opened this up so that we can figure out that how much weight we assign to different stakeholders. So uh, that's basically, if there is any further clarification, I can make it, but x, i, j, k at the end is the impact function of, uh, like say, uh, i, uh, alternative with respect to j, criteria. So that's the matrix. Uh, that we have, <laughs> and um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to make it more clear as we move on, is that, uh, so the criteria that we looked at, but th those criteria and alternatives were, were developed after intense deliberations mm -hmm. with about 18 participants uh, in a workshop, and uh, uh, that, was, that was about three-day workshop, and uh, the participants represented people from government, uh, national government, WWF, and so IUCN, international folks, national level, and then also local level people, the stakeholders who represented different interests of villagers and uh, uh, the local government level people. And um, um, after the deliberation, they agreed on, uh, we started out with a lot, a bit much larger criteria and then we, um, using value mapping techniques, we restricted them to about six criteria. Um, those were like the, on this axis, uh, socio-cultural value, social equity, good governance, economic welfare, ecosystem services, and biodiversity protection. But some people were concerned that ecosystem services and biodiversity protection were overlapping, but they, uh, some of the people wanted to keep them separate, so in the end they decided to keep them separate. Um, and we, they, they broke them on three spatial dimensions, uh, local, national, and international, and then uh, they assigned constant some weights uh, to these, so these are in, uh, on the left side is the pre-deliberative individual level weights uh, that these 18 participants assigned to these. And as you can see that, uh, the local level biodiversity protection at the far end of the left side picture, that is like the highest weight. And these are 95% confidence intervals around uh, those uh, means. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the, the social equity and social cultural <coughs> values, uh, even though they were talking a whole lot about it, uh, those are not assigned as much weight. Rather, uh, economic welfare and ecosystem services protection, um, um, I mean, they are like, rather given higher weight. Uh, you, what sort of, what, I mean, that, that big weight for biodiversity, is that is like food sources or <coughs> actually just, I mean, you know, do you know why the local gave such high weight? Right, they, they, they when we talked to them, they said that they liked living with those animals. They feel, uh, they, they, they said that they've been moved to this suburban place which, where they have these walls and these concrete buildings and they feel like they have been moved to hell. I mean, they just had such uh, an imagery in their language when uh, the people who translated for us that it was like really poetical imagery that uh, they, they said that they really uh, felt at home living closer to the animals inside the park. So they, so they really uh, assign very high value to them. Um, the impact functions, these are the normalized impact functions. And as you can see, we basically for each, I'm, I'm sorry it's not too big, this is in the paper, we have it. Um, it's, uh, there are like five options that we were considering. So on the top left is the national park, that's the business as usual scenario. And it's on one axis of the valuation criteria and the scales, the same as in the previous picture. And so in this case, the, the, the normal scores are from 0 to 100. So the, the larger the number, that means uh, that would have positive impact, and the lower the number, that means. So that's how the scores have been normalized. Uh, and uh, uh, what we see is that in the national park, for example, the impact functions, normalized impact functions are uh, showing that um, a lot of the like in the case of National Park, biodiversity protection would have much more positive impact as opposed to like say in the, in the bottom left, this is the open area develop, uh, case, like you just get rid of any uh, regulation and declare that open area to be open to the market penetration. And in that case, you would see that the biodiversity protection loses uh, all its, uh, uh, and it would have the most adverse impact. But on the other hand, uh, there would be some uh, short term maybe local benefits in terms of economic welfare and social equity issues, like they might drive some benefits once the market penetrates. But uh, so, so those are the two extreme versions. 
And then we have like uh, the other alternatives were like the multiple use area uh, and game control area and game reserve area. And these are basically international union for conservation of nature categorizations of different uh, um, 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 of, 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 ma of uh, wildlife um, management areas. Um, this is the summary uh, in terms of the expected value function. So uh, what we see is that, uh, and these are like uh, in the middle are the, uh, the averages, so this is the VI that I showed in that equation, that the expected value function is summed across. And what we see is that, um, I mean, of course, statistically, it's not much different because of the number of participants is very small. Uh, but if we look at just the, the averages, uh, we're looking at uh, the open area is uh, dominated by other alternatives. Uh, but when we look at um, the, the national park is uh, preferred by a couple of groups. So, um, and, and on the individual basis, it seems that the multiple use area is the preferred alternative. But there was an intense discussion. Uh, at the individual level, people preferred multiple use area, but after they, we brought them into groups, they, they, um, some of them switched their minds and went back to uh, the multiple use area, oh, sorry, the national park, which is the current status. So, but if we break this data by uh, the expected values by uh, the spatial scale as well as uh, the valuation criteria, we see that um, the, the, if in the case of national park, we see that clearly uh, that that's the top left, uh, uh, the panel number A, uh, the, the highest expected value is derived by the, uh, by the international community from biodiversity protection uh, national park uh, management option. On the other hand, the least expected value uh, in the case of uh, open area is derived by, at, at the, um, in the case of the open area. But when we see that uh, in the case of the uh, panel number D, where we have the mixed use area as an option, uh, the local community has consistently higher expected value across all the five alternatives. So the local scale uh, wins across all the five criteria <laughs> according to the mixed use. <coughs> and these are the individual based expected value. So to summarize, my, some of the key findings that we have is uh, that um, of course, uh, we, we needed much more time to have like an intergroup level discussion, um, um, but because of the time constraints, we didn't carry them out, uh, at least for this particular study. Uh, but we believe that aggregation of individual and group level results is an intrinsic issue, even if we replicate these workshops with different stakeholder groups. How do we assign weights to international stakeholders versus national stakeholders versus the local people? That is a key problem, and that has been raised in the previous multiple criteria we've seen analysis studies uh, by m different people that we cite in our study. So that so that this aggregation challenge is what appears that appears to break down MCDA and some of these other multi-criteria methodologies. Uh, is that is that what that side character would be representing? Yes. Okay. Yes. That's now exactly. I, so I was wondering what uh, I just would like maybe an example of like a more real world interpretation of right that? so in what happens is that say if we take the wwf person's bait mm -hmm. and look at the uh, okay. because they are the ones who are really controlling the decision making in some sense uh, in in cahoots with the national government people so that weight is more like a weight of their power in the decision right. making exactly so if we assign more weight to them which reflects the re real case then that would automatically mean that it works. Uh, uh, I mean, we, we observe that uh, the, the national park comes out to be, the management scenario comes out to be the most favored scenario. But if we assign more weight to the local people, then mixed use uh, scenario comes out to be. So, so, so how do you assign the weight? Uh, how much weight do you give to the local people in this decision making? Uh, that's really the key challenge that we have. Another, so I mean, we, we argue that at least this methodology, I mean, apart from these issues, at least it, without making any assumptions, we can do a, a lot of sensitivity analysis or whatever with these psi or these weights. 
uh, but this at least makes that transparent whatever value functions we listed across different scales. Uh, we do reject the null hypothesis that, um, that the management option of conservation provides equal value to local, national, and international communities. Um, even with aiding party friends, we are able to uh, uh, reject that based on the distributions. Uh, the management option of conservation provides higher value to international, followed by national, and least of all local communities. Uh, and um, multiple use area is favored uh, at the individual level, assuming like everybody gets equal weight and open area is dominated, at least in both individual and group level. Um, so this current management scenario at least provides an insight into the politics of scale that's going on there. Um, so that's symptomatic of many conservation type management scenarios in developed and developing countries. We have seen that in at least other case study sites as well. Um, and uh, we, we argue that the, at least the transparent explication of these uh, kind of methodologies, <laughs> multi-criteria decision analysis methodologies enables us to identify and discuss alternative, alternate management options uh, that could balance, balance the current politics of scale back towards uh, local level social organization. So we can have a decent debate uh, that has been ignored uh, for in, the, in the context of uh, management of biodiversity hotspots. Um, so we argue that instead of having extreme, just purely development focused or purely conservation focused uh, management options, finding some kind of balance, some kind of Goldilocks balance between the two options is the key. But how do we find it? Uh, through deliberations, through discussion, by bringing together different people on the table and having that uh, discussion iteratively, uh, that's the key. Um, and. Um, One of the final points, uh, that's the direction of our future research, uh, is that uh, the, the quantification of cross-scale value distributions could also provide insight regarding the appropriate magnitude and direction of payment for ecosystem services and other compensatory mechanisms from international and national level to local level social organizations, um, especially when we are trying to figure out balance for mixed uh, management scenarios. Um, and this would definitely require a lot more uh, study, but uh, one important point that I want to, so for example, the ecologists on our team had calculated exactly the, the changes in the ecosystem services with respect to these different management options. So we can use that data to calculate uh, the, the magnitude and the direction in terms of the changes, and we do not even have to quanti monetize them. We can just uh, calculate them based on the expected value function that we derive here. So some of the related research papers, um, uh, so this paper that I just talked about, this is under review at Ecology and Society. Uh, one of the papers that has come out uh, that pr pr provides the broader uh, theoretical background is McShane et al. This is called Hard Choices, Making Trade-offs Between Biodiversity Conservation and Human Well-Being. This is uh, Biological Conservation. Um, another paper, we applied this trade-off methodology with different scale issues to the RED policy. This is red is the reduced emissions for deforestation and forest degradation. And that's Hirsch et al. Uh, that's in press. It's online available. Uh, that's uh, acknowledging conservation trade-offs and embracing complexity. And the other paper that I have, I applied the same deliberative multiple criteria analysis method, but as not just as spatial scale issues, rather the temporal scale issues in Vietnam. And uh, in, that's the last paper that's under review at uh, General of Environmental Management and where we tested that whether Vietnamese are impatient to consume their natural resources or they can, they can delay their consumption for future generations. And what we found was that uh, Vietnamese have negative discount rates. So that was one of the most surprising findings. Who the, the, the Vietnamese, oh, oh. as opposed to the, the, the yeah. international and the national people. So when we applied the same methodology. So if anybody is interested, I can share that paper. That's the, both of these papers that are under review, they've just been finished last month. So they are we just very, very, very recent work. So that's it. Thank you.